Dehydration of alcohols. In this experiment, we're going to dehydrate an alcohol via acid catalyzed dehydration to form uh, various isomeric forms of methyl cyclohexene from 2 slash methyl cyclohexanol. Before we start, let's look at the chemicals being used. We're going to be using the 2 methyl cyclohexanol. So this is going to be our reactant. Um, phosphoric acid, this will be used at the end during deprotonation, which we'll talk about in the mechanism. And anhydrous sodium, which is going to be used to, in order to dry, dry our products at the end. So then finally, we can do an IR and analyze if we did in fact get the product we, we were intending to get. We don't have any halogens here, so everything would just be disposed in non halogenated waste container or down, or down to the drain with lots of water. And we have some here, some safety things you might want to keep in mind while the experiment is occurring. Also, let's look at the, at the equipment and apparatus we're going to be using in the experiment. Now, we're going to be using the 5 liter uh, conical vial here with the spin vane, which is this thing here, right here. And we're going to be using a centrifuge tube as a receiver when we set up our sample distil our simple distillation apparatus. Here we have our water jagged condenser, thermometer, our vial, and it's going to be placed over a hot plate. Another thing to I wanted to say was that in our simple distillation apparatus, we're going to be connecting um, to our water jacket condenser these, this tubing into our water supply and this one into the down the drain. So we're going to be passing water through the inside the water jacket condenser in order to condense our vapors into the centrifuge tube, which are being heated up here. The purpose of this is because we're trying to we're trying to heat up our our alcohol and we're trying to make it go E1 reaction and we'll talk about this at the end. In the first step of this experiment we're going to place in our 5 milliliter conical vial 1 milliliter of 2 methyl cyclohexanol and 2 milliliters of 85 percent phosphoric acid and as well as the spin vein. So here we have our 2 methyl cyclohexanol and our 85% phosphoric acid. From this picture, I just wanted to show you our water is going through this hose into the water jacket condenser, moving through and then coming out down the drain. Now we're going to heat the content to a gentle boil um, below 96 degrees Celsius. Alright, so now we're going to see a video where we have our condensation occurring. We're going to be seeing, seeing how the vapors condensing will move down the water jacket denser and decondense into our product and into the receiver. So the first video... Um, if you saw, we saw the spin vein moving about here, we saw some vapors moving up, and then, of course, we're going to see next the receiver in our next video. So... There was a first drop of um, our product. We should be getting around 0.5 to 0.7 milliliters. So here are some observations we saw. Our, our sample turned a bright orange, which ended up getting darker and darker as time went by. And then 
losing that color. And here we have a picture of the receiver. Uh, the 0.5, maybe 0.6 here is how much the student got. 5 milliliters. Alright, here's our step 4, which we cannot... We cannot go to our step five without first discontinuing the heat and waiting for the apparatus to cool down before we take it apart. This is safety as well. All right, so in step five, we're going to be drying the collected product with an hydrogenous sodium sulfate right here. And then transferring the dried content into a test tube using the pipette cotton plug technique. Right here we have our little cotton so we can stop things from passing through as much as possible. Any perhaps leftover sodium. And we're going to be collecting it in a small flask. So here's your collector. Or test tube whatever you prefer. So finally we're going to be testing our product to see if we have what we think we have and we're going to be running it in this this computer here that collects the spectrum that you're going to be putting here. So what we do is we're, what we do is that we use methyl chloride to clean this these little glass they're not made out of glass they're we're going to be putting our sample between here like a sandwich and then placing it into this little apparatus closing it in putting into this into the computer in here and taking down the IR all right so from here what we can appreciate what we can see is that we have a CH group around the 300 here which definitely is seen in our in our cyclohexene and methyl group. Another thing we can note from here is this section right here, which implies an aromatic. An aromatic ring. And we can also here we have possible double bond around the 1600. So here we have the 1600 aromatic and the CH around 300. These results imply the presence of a cyclohexene, methyl cyclohexene. From our IR spectrum, we confirmed that methyl cyclohexene is present. What we could not determine, however, was if there was isomeric forms of methyl cyclohexene. Uh, in this experiment, we're going to see what different types may be present by going over the mechanism. The first step in the mechanism is going to be the protonation of the alcohol. Alright, so here we have our 2-methyl cyclo cyclohexanol um, skeleton and we're going to have it react with uh, this hydronium ion. So let's give this a positive charge. And this is going to react with in this matter. So the electrons on the on this bond are going to go to the oxygen, while the electrons that are in this oxygen, this lone pair, are going to take up this hydrogen. Thus, we're going to get we're going to get water attached to our cyclohexene now, plus water. One thing that I wanted to mention before we go on to the next step was that this acid catalyzed dehydration was facilitated by heat from the simple distillation. In the second step of the mechanism, we're going to have the loss of water. So, because this water has a charge, it's rather unstable. So, 
this double bond here is going to go to the oxygen here and thus we're going to form um, a secondary carbocation right here and water which contains two lone pairs one that it had initially these here and then other lone pairs that were pri provided by the double bond so for the third step of this experiment, we're going to do see if we can do some re rearrangement to change our secondary carbocation right here and make it into a tertiary carbocation. So if we do a hydride shift, we can shift this hydrogen that was originally here, switch it in our transitional step to this carbon here. Now, once we rearrange it, the positive carbocation will now be here in a tertiary form, the most stable. Now, the final step is going to be the deprotonation or the loss, the loss of hydrogen. There's different products we can get by different pathways, and we're going to first look at what gives us the major product. So, in order to dehydrate an alcohol, we need an adjacent hydrogen to this carbocation. So here we have um, our major product and if you notice this double bond is tetra substituted. So according to Z Zetsa's rule this is a major stable product. Now we're going to look at a minor product. This pathway, we have we're going to look at a hydrogen that's a, an adjacent carbon from this carbocation on the methyl group. Um, the previous one had the carbon here. These carbons are the same because there's symmetry, but it was a hydrogen on this adjacent carbon up here. So when these oxygen, the electrons of this oxygen take up or accept this proton and uh, the electrons on this bond make the double bond here we see that we have a disubstituted product and that is a minor product it's less unstable according to Zeitzet's rule now the final product comes when we when we actually, before we form our stable tertiary carbocation, when we have our secondary carbocation, we can actually, we can actually get a product already. So, in this, in these adjacent carbons, the hydrogens on these carbons, from the secondary carbocation, the electrons can make double bond here or here. Now, this one would give us the same product, product A, the most stable. But if we do the double bond here, we're going to get this brand new product here, which is di also disubstituted, but less, it's, it's less present because the secondary carbocation is not as not preferred over tetri carbocation, but we could get this product. So in the end, we see three types of products from tetra substituted, the most stable, to the di substituted, less stable, and are also di substituted but less frequent because it's made before carbocation is tetri carbocation. Uh, is made. Thus, our secondary carbocation would give us this product, but less frequent again.